You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Broadcast continuing on now with our most beloved uh, visitor every Monday, second hour, uh, Brother George Widger. Brother George, welcome to the broadcast. Well, thank you, Brother Eric. As always, it's a pleasure to be on with you. It's always a pleasure to have you. <laughs> you always come up with some tremendous revelations that I just am so thankful for. Like the last two of the previous broadcasts that you were on with me where Clyde Tolson uh, bought a ticket for for James Earl Ray. But anyway, there are many things you bring to the broadcast, and I just want to thank you so much for all your work that you do. And I know it's not easy, and I know it's not appreciated, but I want you to know it's appreciated here. So go ahead, brother. Well, well thank you. Before I address that, uh, I have my scripture verse is Proverbs 19, verse 5. Proverbs 1, 9, verse 5. And this may sound familiar. A false witness shall not not be unpunished, and and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Okay, so you could say there will always be consequences for people's actions. Oftentimes, not while we're still alive in the temporal sense, but always in the eternal sense. Amen. Of course, and also temporal, temporal too. I mean, we reap what we sow, even now. Yes. I mean, not well, like we, not like it's going to be in eternity at the day of judgment, the great white throne for those that are unsaved. But, hey Amen. We we reap to a large degree in what we do for now. Go ahead. Okay. Case in point. Well, there's a certain fellow. I mean, I, I don't. People keep saying, you know, why do I keep picking on Tony Fauci? Well, I mean, he's a nice old man. He's a a kindly doctor who just wants to help people. And well, and of course, you know, he just retired. Uh, his base salary was something like $480,000 a year, almost half a million dollars, of which he gets almost three-fourths of that. We're just talking about his base salary. Uh, I have no idea how much he gets in kickbacks from Pfizer and Moderna and all these other companies, but he's probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Because as I've said before, among other things, he's also... He is or was on the board of directors for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, he has the Jesuit connection. And the Jesuit connection of Fauci is not being um, spoken of very much. I mean, there's a couple of guys that do it. Um, that one chiropractor um, did it. And also on that one particular broadcaster, um, oh, he has a broadcast that he regularly talks about the shot, and so he did address the Jesuits. He had a, a black Seventh-day Adventist on his program a couple of times, Stu Peters. <clears throat> but there's no real attack of, of the, on the fact that Fauci is a Jesuit co-adjutor, was trained by them in this entire whole mass uh, poisoning is the work of the Jesuit order. It's amazing their power over the press where they can keep this down. But go ahead, George. Oh, okay, if I could just uh, talk about something that's semi-local, a matter that's semi-local. This is something that uh, uh, Peggy Hall exposed of the Healthy American. She said, almost all of your health officers in California have worked for the Centers for the Catholic Disease Creator in Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. Catholic Disease Creator. <laughs> Very good. Centers uh, for Disease Control in Atlanta. Okay. Georgia. Uh or the World Health Organization, or both. So, case of what locally, my health officer, or the health officer in my ca- county, Sindari Mace, she worked for both uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization. She not only worked for the CDC, but she was on the board of directors. So, uh, so basically, for the last three, well, two plus years, she's been sa- talking about the safety and efficacy of the. Um, so she's um, want to be mean. But you could say that um, she is a whore for big karma, um, figuratively, of course. Um, so that's why she's being paid to push all these injections. Yeah, well, she's probably making a lot of money. And after all, money answereth all things, you know. It doesn't matter it being the love of money, being the root of all evil, hence the root of this evil. Is the love of money also? Of course, the Jesuits love money. They want it all, and they about have it all. But go ahead, brother. Well, here's a little factoid. I just heard this that back in the year 2020, 
2% uh, of the deaths in Australia were listed as unknown, so one out of 50. However, the following year, 2021, the number climbed to 18%. So you had a, a nine-fold increase in one year. In Australia. Correct. Remembering historia, well, Australia is historically a white Protestant nation, now apostate and infidel. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, and this is something most people are not talking about, uh, that um, they have a huge increase of causes unknown, is like almost a tenfold increase in one year is astronomical. Surely is. Well, what it means is they don't want to tell you what they died of. So we'll just say cause unknown for this death. Uh, so... Anyhow, but I, I realize, you know, we live in a fallen world because of sin. People get sick. Uh, people die, especially when they become elderly. Yes, you understand. You know, that is the way. That, but sometimes people have assistance. Now, do you remember the Italian actress Gina Lola Brigida? Uh, Gina Lola Bridget? Is that what uh, Bridget. Yes, yeah, she just died at the age of 95. Now, she was considered to be the rival of Sophia Loren. Now, Gina was 95. Um, Sophia is almost 90, but uh, she, um, <laughs> um, among other things, she actually had to go, uh, she was married twice, and uh, her last second marriage ended in 2006, but it, her annulment wasn't officially recognized until 2019, when she actually had to appeal directly to Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. Very good, because, well, the Pope was in charge of that marriage, and uh, according to Roman Catholic canon law, you can't get a divorce. So I guess she had to go to the Pope to get an annulment or something like that? Well, yes, and, you know, until the 1960s, uh, annulments almost never happened in the Catholic Church. You had a few, like Frank Sinatra, who could get one. But basically, in places like the Irish Republic, um, which has historically been a Catholic country, um, you couldn't get divorced. You could live with somebody, you could have illegitimate children, no problem, but you could not get a divorce. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was checking out something in Wiley when I was reading his, um, uh, on the Jesuits, work on the Jesuits, and he talked about a certain poison. And he said, I checked out the poison, and this poison was used by the wives, the Roman Catholic wives in Italy during the Dark Ages who couldn't get a divorce. So rather than not being able to get a divorce, which they couldn't get, they just poisoned their husbands. It's a special name for that poison. I'll have to check it out and bring it back to you. But that's what the doctrine of no divorce brings. Go ahead, brother. Oh, oh okay. So, well, actually, the Irish Republic, fairly recently, the 1990s, legalized divorce. Uh, well, the last, uh, I'm not sure, with the last five or six years, they actually legalized abortion. Now, I, I need to address that in terms of the Irish Republic. So what people, what young women, teenage girls would do if they want, want an abortion is they just usually go to Northern Ireland or England to get one. So we'll go to these apostate white Protestant countries and get our abortions, right? Because the Catholic countries forbade it which would be a biblical thing to do. Same way in Mexico, abortions are illegal in Roman Catholic Mexico. So we just come up north here to Yankee North, apostate Protestant, and we'll get our abortions here. Yeah, okay. Further bringing innocent blood on our hands. All uh, right, yes. So, but as I said, you know, people, okay. Um, now, I forgot the source for this, but over the last two years, the average life expectancy has declined in the United States. It's now approximately 76 years. Um, and people would just say, oh, it's because of the pandemic. Oh, that simply uh, uh, answers that question. But a reduction of the age of one year, statistically, is a huge number. And I have a gut feeling the number is going to continue to decline. I would agree. Especially among whites. Remembering that whites are only 10 to 12 percent of the world population. Got to be, got to beat these white people down and get them to adopt sinful lives where they're not going to have children. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 
I forget this or this is something I read in, in a sociology class um, that women who delay marriage until the age of 30, for some reason, are, generally speaking, are not going to have three children. Yes, if, if she marries at 30 or even 35, it is you know, theoretically possible she could have at least three children. But there's something, I don't want to say magical, but there's just something, it's like a psychological barrier because something that has been drilled into most young ladies' minds for decades is, well, you know, you have to go to college, you have to get a career, you know, it's also a good idea to get a uh, graduate degree, law degree, master's, whatever. And then when you're 30, 35-ish, you might want to get married, and then you might want to have one or two children. And if you do, you know, you can have a nanny take care of them. Yeah, no family. No family situation. No center around the kitchen. That's right. Remember, historic white Protestant nations in the past always had a lot of children. I was reading my, uh, it's a, a book on the Phelps dynasty or the Phelps clan, whatever you want to call it. And it's just kind of page after page of who was related to who and how many children they had. Many of them had six, eight, ten children. So it was a growing white Protestant population in New England area where the Phelps family was. So now we don't have that. We don't have anything less than two. Ch two children is keeping things e equal, down to zero. Anything above that begins to raise the population. But they don't mm -hmm. want to have children anymore. They'd rather have a dog. That's why mm -hmm. I call these white women dog women, the majority of them. They'd rather do things for their dogs rather than have their children and be subject to their husbands. Okay. Ah, well, uh, you also have cat ladies. That's true. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so, um, it, it, you know, uh, get, getting back to my uh, <laughs> presentation, over the weekend, George Cardinal Pell died. He, um, oh, he, was, he lived the 8th of June, 1941, died on January 10th, 2023, so he was 81 years old. He was considered to be the top churchman, a Catholic churchman in Australia. Uh, his background was he was a secretariat of the economy from 2014 to 19. So basically, he was the finance minister for uh, the Vatican. Uh, he was the head of the Council of Advisors from 2013-18. Um, he was ordained a, a priest in 1966. Um, he was an auxiliary bishop of uh, Melbourne from 1987 to 96, and he was the archbishop of Melbourne from 96 to 2001. Mm -hmm. Now, he was considered to be in the leading uh, for Pope, the Pope, uh, one of the leading candidates to be Pope back in 2005 and 2013. Now, Revelations came out that while he was in the seminary back in the early 1960s, he had molested a 12-year-old boy, and he was never he was never tried for that. So because uh, he was a prince of the church, you never see a prince of the church on trial in a in a civilian court sitting emergency war powers military jurisdiction in this country. I don't know of any cardinal that's ever been prosecuted in this country. They're above well, the law. Well, he, he was Australian, so there's basically, uh, but the idea applies there. Mm -hmm. Right. They're untouchable. This is the horrible, terrible doctrines of temporal power. Every cardinal is an extension of the sovereignty of the Pope. Every church is an extension of the sovereignty of the Pope because every Catholic church is regarded to be situated on church property, which is part of the sovereign state of Vatican City. This is why when the seizure took place on March 9th, 1933, it didn't include Roman Catholic property. So it's about a political power. It's about a sovereign nation, sovereign state of Vatican City, and its senator, Cardinal Pell, would never be prosecuted as no one else would ever be prosecuted. Now, is that spelled S-E-N or S-I-N? For a... Uh, who's that? The name? Senator. Oh, Senator. Okay, yeah. Senator. Heavy on not, the sin. Amen. Mm -hmm. Not to be heavy, not to be confused with Frank Sinatra. Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Heavy, heavy uh, on the uh, sin. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Now, also, uh, on the 12th, last Thursday, Lisa Marie Presley died. She was the only child of Elvis. 
she lived from the 1st of February 1968 till January the 12th. So she was married four times. One of her husbands, allegedly, was Michael Jackson. Another one of her husbands was um, Nicholas Coppola, a.k.a. Nicholas Cage. So Nick, Nicholas... And he's uh, related to another Coppola? Correct. Francis Ford, that's his uncle. I see. Wasn't it a Coppola that wrote The Godfather? Well, he directed The Godfather, or at least Godfather 1. Okay. He also did Apocalypse Now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola, along with uh, Martin Scorsese, uh, people don't know this, but they're two of the directors of the Woodstock film. I see. Was that the documentary? Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. That took place. Uh, and, the, and that and the Jesuits have, I believe, a novitiate in Woodstock. Uh, they still have correct. it. Mm-hmm. So, um, they also were re- responsible for uh, filming, or at least Scorsese was involved with filming the uh, the Asmont, uh massacre in California in 1969, featuring the Rolling Stones. Oh, Altamont? Uh, correct. Mm-hmm. When the when the Hell's Angels were there and they were the police. Yes. They killed the guy with a pool cue, knifed him with it. I saw that video. Mm-hmm. Well, I say massacre is more of a, um, just a simple murder. Yeah, it was uh, a murder. Mm-hmm. But um, the. Um, remembering the connection of the Knights of Malta with Rolling Stones, right? It, yes. So, you know, Lisa Marie, she died. Her father, Elvis, was a known Freemason. Nicholas Cage, as I said, is a Roman Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic, known Freemason. So at least one of her husbands was a Freemason. Now it's interesting. Elvis is was that Scottish, known, right? Uh, I believe York. York, right? Elvis was York or Cage? No, no, no. Elvis was uh, Scottish, right? And uh, Nicholas Cage is York. And Nicholas Cage was a York. York, right, which is the Catholic branch, supposedly, of Freemasonry, whereas Scottish right is supposedly the Protestant branch. Mm-hmm. All both of them working for the Pope. Uh, y- yeah. Yes. So, gee, not to trample on her grave or her dad's grave, but they're used as a one-two punch in his generation to demoralize and destabilize the culture, and she basically did the same thing. Yeah. Well, she really didn't have a chance being the daughter of this uh, perverse Elvis Presley. So I can't blame her a lot, you know, because this is how she was raised. And I mean, she was wrong. But with a father like that, a serial fornicator and a serial doper, it's going to affect the children. And it surely affected her. Well, and vis-a-vis, you know, the fact that she was married four times. Mm-hmm. And he uh, sent her to marry Michael Jackson to try to cover up his pedophilia. Uh, uh, it looked like he was heterosexual. Okay, go ahead. Well, I, was Michael into boys? Pardon? Was he into boys? Of course. You know that, George. Oh, okay. So that would actually, that elevates it. That makes him, that would have made a white pell a pederast. That's correct. Which is, um, so that's like, um, that's a whole other conversation altogether, because if I go down that rabbit hole, that'll chew up my entire remaining time, because there are a couple of points I need to try to get to. Um, to here in the United States, we call it MLK Day, Martin Luther King Day, uh, even though his birth name was actually Michael. He never actually legally changed it to Martin Luther. Um, it was a- right. So his his birth name, his real name was Michael King, correct. And he never changed formally changed his name to Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. And I would maintain that the Jesuits were busy with that change to give Martin Luther, the reformer, a bad name. Well, <laughs> because King was absolutely a notorious socialist communist and a very wicked man. Okay, so you asked me to talk about him. Well, y- yesterday was his birthday, 1929, or today would have been his 94th birthday, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, I- anyhow, uh, there have been at least two popular songs that deal in part with Martin Luther King. 
One which I've discussed before, um, oh, um, Dion DiMucci's song, Abraham, Martin, and Bob, or a a Abraham, Martin, and John. Well, Bob is not in the title. It makes reference to uh, Robert uh, Francis Kennedy Sr. And another song came out, oh, was it 88 or 89, by the Irish band U2, in the name of love. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about April 4 um, in the, the Memphis sky. It's talking about April the 4th, 1968, the date on uh, which uh, King was assassinated. Okay, so now, as I said, the... The lead singer of YouTube, Bono, uh, who was born Paul Houston, uh, I just found this out recently. He, I'm not sure what he did this, but he's actually a knight of Saint Sil Saint Sylvester. A knight of Saint Sylvester, same knighthood that that um, Wild Bill Donovan was a member of. Yes, there's a picture of him receiving that award in the Vatican in the book, um, The Last Hero. Written by Anthony K. Brown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'm not sure what Bono did to warrant this knighthood. And what was his last name? Paul what? Houston. Houston. H Houston, H-E-W-S-O-N. Now, it's interesting. Um, his mom is Catholic, but his dad is uh, Presbyterian. Irish R.C., and his dad is apostate Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, yes. So um, now I used to like listening to YouTube because, well, um, uh, by the way, he, he performed at least one pretty major performance at Jesuit Fordham University in New York. Oh, OK. Yes. Yeah, I think I knew that. Um, uh, and their manager, uh, OK, what's his name for the uh, for YouTube? Uh, McGinnis. Ian McGinnis, if I'm not mistaken, he went to uh, Clogan, a famous Jesuit school in Ireland. Uh, Clo I'm not pronouncing it. Uh, so um, the rest of the members of the band, uh, as they're all Catholic, or at least you know, novelly Catholic. So mm -hmm. there were... Um, so U2 was a, really an Irish Roman Catholic band, right? Correct. And they had uh, a manager that went to the a Jesuit institution. Uh, yeah, a Clogan. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wish and, your buddy and, Eric Hardigan Hard Hard were, were available. He he knows all about Ireland. Um, I, I wish we, yeah, yeah. Todd Hanlon or, or Eric Hardigan were here. <laughs> they could answer. That would all be about nice. It. That would be nice indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I, I was going to talk about YouTube, so I'm a little bit. I'm not prepared to talk. Oh, that's okay. Then don't. Just, you, we mentioned YouTube, and it's a Catholic band. It's demoral, further demoralized the, the people, and uh, its manager was trained by Jesuits, and so we can just leave it there. And all the more reason not to listen to them. Mm -hmm. So the uh, so, so, but the last place that Martin Luther King uh, went to before his assassination on the fourth of April was the Masonic Lodge in Memphis. So. King went to the to the Masonic Lodge in Memphis before Correct. he was assassinated. Correct. The, the day before, or the third. What did he go there for? Um, I don't know. Uh, as a tourist, uh, who knows? Hold just a second. Hey, brother. Con Congos? Klongos. That's that, that's the that's the school Klongos. Okay, thank you much, brother. Okay, that was brother Eric. He said it was Klongos. Klongos okay. that he went to. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so I should have, was it e Ian McGinnis? I want to say. Um, but uh, I can check the his name. Uh, but um, uh, yeah. So uh, the. Uh, Last place uh, King went to the day before was the Masonic Temple in Memphis. And it was uh, Scottish Rite, pre Masonic Scottish Rite? Yes. Even though he so was. So did he get inside? Did he go for a tour or did he, was he a member somewhere which enabled him to get in? Well, that I don't know. Maybe he just went for a tour and wanted to tour the Masonic Lodge before he 
would get shot. Do you think that might be it, or do you think he was somehow connected to Freemasonry? Well, all the above. <laughs> well, he was also a member of the Boule Society, according to the late black uh, researcher Steve Coakley. So, and Coakley viciously and rightfully attacked King for what he was doing and exposed exposed that other brother Freemason, Jesse Jackson, as part of the conspiracy to assassinate King. But So he went to a Masonic Lodge. King went to a Masonic Lodge. What, the day before he was assassinated? Is that what you're saying? Correct. The day before. Okay. But you see, uh, I, I think um, King, the problem was, yes, they had used him for well over, over a decade, 15 years or so, to foment racial agitation in the United States. But I, I think sure. King... Um, was becoming disobedient. I would agree. I would agree. Uh, he was actively speaking out against the war uh, in Vietnam. As a matter of fact, on April the 4th, 1967, exactly one year before his uh, assassination, he actually spoke out against the war. And on April 4th, 1967? Correct. He spoke out. Okay, Spellman is still alive at this time. He's going to die in 67 and later 67. So his the guy who replaced him must have then oversaw, Terrence Cardinal Cook must have oversaw the assassination using the essentially pretty much the same team that was involved with the JFK assassination. Mm-hmm. Or X or Bobby or... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, um, so, so a year before he spoke against the Vietnam War. Yes. Now, I just wondering, you allowed, okay, so they were allowed to have, they did permit controlled oppositions, the hippies, uh, the, the young men who were usually college age, late teens, early 20s, with the long hair and the beards and the tie-dye. And they also allowed the Berrigan brothers to speak out. I was, I was just going to mention, Berrigan brothers were very much attached to them. Who were the Berrigan brothers, Brother George? There were a couple of priests. That's right. They were Jesuits. Doing their duty, although it was giving the appearance that they were disobedient, but they were most obedient to their provincials. So the Berrigan brothers, part of this agitation. Back in a moment, 24-7 World Radio with Brother George Richard. This is The Eric John Phelps Show on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags amerikanische Zeit für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. Ich bin hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke Dienstag um 2 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is 24-7 World Radio and you're listening to The Eric John Phelps Show. George, you were brought some very interesting things with regard to the Berrigan brothers and Martin Lucifer King being a Freemason. Of course, he's a member of Boule, just an agitator under, I would add, A. Philip Randolph, who was a black Freemason and subject to the Jesuit, John Lafarge out of Georgetown University. So the whole civil rights movement was a Jesuit communist movement to incite racial agitation. It was never really to benefit the blacks. Go ahead. Oh, okay, so, uh, yes, uh, I, I don't have anything else to add to that. Um, I, I will say that, um, well, it's just basically the whole history of Michael Martin Luther King has been rewritten. I forget the 
Hun has been whitewashed. All, all of his sins have been written out of the history books for the most part. You know, this actually right. years ago when I was um, uh, years ago when I was working on my degree, I had to take a civil rights class. That's another conversation altogether. It was part of my actually I had to take a couple of civil rights classes. Um, one of which was I had to take in order to graduate in my history class. And we had a discussion. So the professor said, would you, if you're alive when Martin Luther was, or if you're still alive now, would you want him to be your pastor? I'm sorry, Martin Luther King. Would you want him to be your pastor? And uh, it seemed like an odd question. Um, and I said, absolutely not. And I was my classmates were dumbfounded. Really? Why is that? Oh, because he's a black man. Well, not, and I said, no, not necessarily. I said, because this is long before I heard of you or Vatican assassins or started to get involved with the whole truth movement. Um, I said, among, in addition to being a notorious flanderer and adulterer, he was a heretic. He, he gave an interview. King loved his white women. He was addicted well, okay. to white women. That's okay. what you need yeah. to say that. Okay, but go ahead. Then he's a philanderer. Yep. Um, well, you read in the walls come tumbling down. Yet Ralph Abernathy talked about King's affairs with black women in the certain cities he was in. So I mean, it was known to everyone. But go ahead. But and of course, he was a full-on heretic. He repudiated the virgin birth. He actually said this in an interview with Ebony Magazine, Ebony or Jet Magazine, 1963. So he was this. Uh, a absolutely not. So people just assume it had to do with race. Now, another figure I know I've discussed him before. And he the denied the bodily resurrection. He denied Christ was the son of God. He was an absolute infidel. So, But you have to be that kind of man to work for the communist movement when he was trained at Highlander School in Tennessee. So if we're going to pretend that we are some man of God when he was nothing more than an immoral philosopher. Okay. And uh, I also. So I, I mentioned this before, but uh, part of my, we had to do, uh, from our class, we had to do a paper on some aspect of, of the civil rights movement. And I decided to do a paper on Thurgood Marshall. And I think I may have mentioned this to you before, but uh, my working title was The Third Good, The Third Bad, and The Third Ugly. And the professor- and Marshall was, was another black Freemason, right? Yes. Or mulatto Freemason. Okay. Well, yes. And of course, you know, he, he made, um, Marshall made King look like a choir boy um, in that when he was married the first time, I think the Jesuits allowed his wife to die, but the, his first wife to die, but that's besides the point. Um, she died of some form of rare cancer. Um, I know that's not funny, but um, he basically, even his biographer, biographers, even his apologists, said he basically had a girl in every port. Mm -hmm. yep. Very evil, wicked, immoral man, and a Freemason, and exalted to the Supreme Court by, who appointed him to the Supreme Court anyway? Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon, brother Freemason, Lyndon Johnson. So you got Freemason Johnson, you got Freemason A. Philip Randolph, uh, working with Lyndon Johnson, the 64 Civil Rights Act, and A. Philip Randolph, overseen by Jesuit John Lafarge, and you got Freemason Thurgood Marshall appointed to the Supreme Court. We can make more left to socialist communist decisions. It's masonry, the arm of the Jesuit order, and this is you black and white Freemasonry working together. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'll, I'll try to clean this up, but uh, Johnson said in 1965, if I get these civil rights bills packed, I'll have the Negro vote for the next 200 years. He says something a little bit harsher. Um, but um, so yeah, because Johnson hated the blacks and he called them niggers. I'm going to have the nigger vote for the next th four years. That's what he said. And people need to hear that word and they need to know LBJ said that in a very detrimental fashion. Of course, he was overseeing the assassination of his Roman Catholic mistresses, uh, lady, black lady that waited upon her. And that's all in the book Texas in the Morning by Madeline Duncan Brown. He was a murderer. Malcolm, Ball Malcolm Wallace killed that black woman at the orders of LBJ. But go ahead. Well, speaking of murder, oh, okay, I, I had a number of topics I want to get to. I'll, I'll try to make sure I get to this. And, and Malcolm right, Wallace was also a member of Skull and Bones. I think you told me that. Uh, I wish I did. Uh, yeah, Malcolm Wallace was Skull and Bones. Got a picture of Malcolm Wallace, William F. Buckley, and George Bush, I believe, all poses bonesmen. Mm -hmm. yep. 
okay. In the first hour, you talked about the firebombing of Dresden, which took place in mid-February 1945, just a few months before the war ended in Europe. Um, and I know we've talked about this several times before. We talked about the Kurt Vonnegut book, Slaughterhouse Five, and so forth. And by the way, I would recommend that and the film. Uh, the, the film took some liberties from the book, but that's another conversation altogether. But um, there are probably dozens of German cities that were bombed by the Allies between 1941, 42, and 45. Um, between 1941 and 1945, actually, the bombing actually started in 39, but uh, it began in earnest in 42 when America officially entered in the war. Um, Probably one of the episodes most people don't discuss is Operation Gamora, which took place in late July, early August 1943, and it dealt specifically with the destruction of the German city of Hamburg. Operation Gamora. Yes. Have you heard of it? I have not. I know they no. bombed Hamburg. In, that's in okay. the north. Of course, Hamburg was the Protestant city. Uh, yes. Operation now, if you Okay. Now, if you look this up in Wikipedia, they say about 37,000 people died, although I tend to find that number of suspects. Uh, it was probably triple digit or six digits, rather, uh, for a myriad of reasons. And so it was the brainchild of, I've mentioned this before, Sir Arthur Harris. Bomber Harris, Sir Arthur Harris. Mm -hmm. Yes. Subject, was, to Winston, subject to smoke and Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, Sir Arthur Tra Travers Harris was actually born in South Africa. Uh, he lived from 1892 to 1984. He, so he died on, he lived from the 13th of April, died on April the 5th. So he died just short of his 92nd birthday. As I said, he was born in South Africa in Transvaal. Um, Transvaal, which was a historic Protestant free state. Yeah, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal, they were considered to be Protestant areas and uh, and they would be targeted they'd be targeted for murder right now where you have all the murders of the white farmers and by the savage black uh, communists the ANC so he was out of, he was out of Transvaal I see okay okay so he moved his family I guess moved to England in the early 20th century um, but um, anyhow so there's two major elements of the bombing campaign throughout the war um, you know, the RAF, the Royal Air Force, had bombed at night, and you know, the American Army Air Force had bombed during the day. And the casualty, the Americans took heavier casualties because it was easier uh, for the Germans to see them. Um, now, it was the RAF was comprised of British pilots mo mostly, but you also had free Irish, or you had volunteer Irish, you had free French, free Dutch, free Polish. So you basically had apostate Protestants and liberal Catholics attacking the apostate German Protestants. Mm -hmm. So it was a win-win situation for Rome. Right. Now, mm -hmm. something, okay, you may be say, how come uh, people like Harris or Henry Hap Arnold, uh, who was considered to be the father, one of the fathers of the American Air Force, and you had um, Carl Spatz, it, uh, Henry Hap Arnold was an apostate Baptist. He was a high-level Freemason. Uh, Carl Spatz was an apostate Lutheran, a high-level Freemason. And you had Curtis Bombs Away LeMay, an apostate Methodist. Now, who's that guy you just said? You've got Henry Hap Arnold. Correct. Who was a Freemason, is the father yes. of the American Air Force, you said. Well, he's considered to be one of the fathers. Now, for what it's worth, the Air Force, as I said— now, who's the other guy you mentioned, Jordan? Carl Spatz. U.S.A.F. and Carl Spatz, who's he now? Is that uh, C or K? Um, uh, Carl, oh, with a, uh, a, a C, I believe. C-A-R-L, Spatz, S-P-O-T-T-S? No, S-P-A-A-Z or Z-T, Spatz. T-Z, T-Z, yeah. Okay, Carl Spatz, and what was he? He was also a Freemason? Uh, yes, he was an apostate Lutheran. Apostate Lutheran. And what did he do? Uh, he was considered to be one of the – well, you had three major figures of what, be, what would become the Air Force. You had Curtis LeMay, Hap Arnold, and Carl Spatz. Oh, I see. Very good. Was Carl Spatz an American or was he a German brought over here? After? Yeah, he was an American. Okay. He, he lived – okay, at the – okay, if I, here's a little 
trivial story. Um, the United States Air Force did become its own separate branch until 1947. September. Correct. Uh, right around the creation of the, of the time of the CIA, I believe September the 12th, if I'm not mistaken. So since it had just broken off from the Army, they wanted to have their own academy. So there are several candidates as to where the Air Force Academy could be. Now, it's in uh, Colorado Springs, and it opened in 1954. But the two other candidates for where it could be were Dayton, Ohio, Wright's um, Patterson Air Force Base, and just also in my backyard, just north of San Francisco, uh, uh, in Hamilton Field. And is, that Ham- is that Hamilton Field? Well, it was called. Well, it was originally called Hamilton Field. It became uh, Hamilton Air Force Base in, in, Mer- in Mern County, California, Nevada. Okay. Um, so uh, spots are <laughs> Arnold lobbied that it, the the new Air Force Academy should be uh, in. Northern California. So the pilots would have flown out of Hamilton in Marin County, and they would have had their school uh, near Santa Rosa, or the current location of Sonoma State University, which is where I graduated. But uh, Arnold died conveniently in ni- 1950 of a heart attack. So uh, they actually be- had begun construction for the academy in 1949, but it was scrapped. So um, they... <laughs> moved it to Colorado Springs. So after his death, they moved the academy to Colorado Springs. Correct. So I had no proof he was murdered, but his uh, time, his death was very convenient. Very convenient because Colorado Springs, coupled with Denver, is going to be the new capital. And they already talked about that in the book um, written by John Rawl Carlson um, in 1942 called um, behind what is it uh, it's called the uh, recover oh, undercover undercover by john roy carlson in 1942 said that the fascists were going to move the government from washington to denver and so colorado springs is an intimate part of denver so that makes sense to me that's why they would move it go ahead uh, okay so you had the destruction of ha- hamburg now, in Operation Gamora, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, they say about 37,000 people died. Uh, that number seems awfully low because it was one of the, uh, Hamburg was one of the first time uh, napalm was actually used. This is uh, something most people don't know. Um, it was, uh, <laughs> so, uh, the use Allies. The, use, use the firestorm in Hamburg. We're going to, Fire all the historic white Protestant Lutheran cities. Wonderful. Uh, okay, that's so, the Jesuit mercies under FDR and Smoke and Winston Churchill. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you had uh, the firebombing of Hamburg, Dusseldorf, uh, Bremen, Bremenhaven, uh, the aforementioned uh, Dresden. So they probably killed. Now remember that, also that that's northern Germany. That's that's uh, near on the North Sea up there, and, and Bremerhaven and Hamburg, and one other city were what was known as the Hanseatic League, and they conducted major commerce into Germany. So to further disrupt the commerce of Germany and render it powerless, we're going to destroy their commercial ports. So go ahead. So I just wonder, why didn't the Germans just simply cash in on all that white privilege they they had? Yeah, why not? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, brother. So it's about the decimation of the white apostate white Protestant Lutheran Germans during World War II. That was more more white Germans were killed than Jews. So even though there was a Eurasian Jewish Holocaust, there was a huge Eurasian Protestant Holocaust that was much bigger. And of course, now I mentioned this before, and I know I may sound nitpicky, but um, there are two conventions that were held, one in 1904 and 1907 called the Hague Convention, which dealt specifically uh, with civilians, i.e. non-combatants in warfare, because this is the beginning of the 20th century, and they realized the technology was changing with the advent of things like uh, machine guns and so forth. And um, our, they said specifically 
In the Hague Conventions of 1904 and 1907, the civilian populations were not to be deliberately targeted. Now, That's right. They called them the private citizens. Because I referred to a section in the Hague Convention, it's Article 23 and Article 43. In Article 23, that the, when, these, when they're conducting a war, that they try not to kill the private citizens. Mm -hmm. However, one of the glaring loopholes uh, of this is it did not specifically mention aircraft, which was a fairly new technology at the time. And it'd be decades before it would actually become a real factor in warfare. Basically, you're talking Spain in the 1930s during their civil war. Um, so the Allies, I'm sure, had to, you know, Harris and Churchill and Roosevelt all had to be cognizant of this, or at least their advisors were. And all of them Freemasons. Well, well yes. So including the, Bomber Harris. Okay, so um, the Allies introduced a concept called terror bombing, in which plane aircraft were supposed to target civilian populations that had virtually no um, strategic value, little or no strategic value whatsoever. It was supposed to be a psychological program. And it so- called it terror bombing, okay. Yes, so the RF, and later the American Army Air Forces introduced the policy of targets of opportunity, whether Spitfires or Mustangs were with strafe roads, and they fire at anything that moved ambulances, bicycles, trains, whatever. Yep. And because so, the Allies were communists. America was communist, run by a communist Freemason named FDR. Stalin was a communist Freemason, running the USSR. Churchill was a communist Freemason, running Great Britain on behalf of King George V another brother Freemason. So it's this huge unified Masonic effort in the annihilation of the historic white Protestant German people during the second, the second half of the second 30 years war. And this is never talked about by anybody that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, you know, there was like one of the, um, you, you, I have heard about this over the years, but this is generally, I was never taught this in school. Um, mm -hmm. With one exception, um, uh, you know, K through 12, the United States, you know, you know, we just studied, you know, World War II and the Holocaust and all that sort of stuff. But the bombing campaign, with the exception of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is for the most part never discussed. That's right. That's right, because it was a Counter-Reformation Council of Trent design for the destruction of historic white Protestant. Europe. That's why Greg Goebel, what was his name, Gehring, in charge of the Luftwaffe, bombed Rotterdam, the great Dutch Protestant city. That's why he bombed London, St. Paul's Cathedral. Back and forth, they didn't bomb any Catholics. That's why they told, that's why they bombed Coventry. Gehring and his Luftwaffe bombed the Protestant town of Coventry, destroying their beautiful church and Hull. H-U-L-L, -L, Hull and Coventry. And to make sure Ireland would not be participating in this, Ireland was neutral. It was not involved with the war. So it was a brilliant, just, there's somebody that needs to write an entire book on this from 1914 to 45. It's going to be a massive work. I, I put a, some of it in there in my chapter 37 of Vatican Assassins, it's 150 pages, but there's someone who could write a tremendous work on how the war was religiously fought overseen by the Jesuits for the decimation of white Protestant Western civilization in the Netherlands, Germany, England, France, um, Denmark, it goes on and on there. But that's a very important topic. And also you're gonna see the, the boundaries change from the end of the 30 years war. That would be changed too. And Goebbels talked about that, ending the boundaries of the 30 years war. Okay, and you also had the huge destruction of Eastern Orthodox in Russia, in Greece, in Romania, Bulgaria, places like that. Yes, absolutely. That's why we have Stalingrad. Stalingrad was not a military target, but Stalin will send his Orthodox men in there, and Hitler will send his Prussian Lutheran men in there for mutual annihilation, so that approximately a million men will die as a result of the Stalingrad battle, to no effect whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and 
<laughs> and as I said, you do they do talk about this, but um, and something we discussed before. So what has happened to Germany? What happened to old historically Protestant Germany? Well, it's occupied. It, it has been for almost eighty years. Yep. You know, you had well, well, it still is occupied in the West with the British, French, and Americans. But for something like roughly forty-five years, it was occupied by the Russians and their allies in the East. And right, they, and and the other thing is too, if I may interrupt, that Prussia ceased to exist in nineteen forty-six. The Jesuits wanted the end of white Lutheran Prussia by any means necessary. And so it formally came to an end in 1946, and that's after Stalin and his Red Army rape machine uh, raped as many Prussian women as they could find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, well, the, well, Germany has been raped basically for the last 100 years. That's correct. Literally, literally and figuratively. I mean, economically. Uh, that, that's why there's a movement in Germany today they call them terrorists and outlaws and whatever. They just want to restore the, the boundaries of the country and restore as it was during the second Protestant Reich. And they've arrested those people. So it's interesting. It's interesting. A similar thing actually happened in the American South after the war between the states mm -hmm. in what was called Reconstruction. So basically, you had – it wasn't NATO, but it was a similar, you had a similar – you had an occupying army in the South. Long, they're there long after the war was, was over. Twelve years, 1865 to 1877. It was a reconstruction to further destroy white Protestant and Baptist Southern culture. And this was practice for what they would do to Germany. What they did to the Protestant South, they did to the Protestants of Germany. Same deal. And they mm -hmm. would use the Yankee Union Savage Army in both instances to do it. Totally run by the Jesuit order out of Washington. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, was it uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's son, Tom, Thomas, would be a Jesuit. That's right. As I mentioned previously, he won, when he was an advisor to Theodore Roosevelt, the Scottish Rite Freemason, he was advising Roosevelt to reenact his father's march to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah. And of course, that march to the sea, they never went through Macon because Macon was a Jesuit stronghold. So they just went around Macon. But the people of the South said, over our dead bodies, you will never reenact the march to the sea going through Georgia. And that's what was recommended to Theodore Roosevelt by Thomas Sherman, the Jesuit. Ah, well, I did have a few other points, but perhaps I'll have to pick them up on, on Monday. Oh, George, we're running out of time. Sorry about that. Uh, so shall I give my contact information? Please do. Please, please do. Mm -hmm. Okay. If people have any questions, comments, or concerns, and yes, uh, <laughs> uh, people have those uh, because I've been getting a number of emails, um, please email me at georgewidger1969 at gmail.com. That's G-E-O-R-W-I-D-G-E-R-1969 at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, critiques, um, um <laughs> uh, want to send me a video, an article, please do. If there's a topic you'd like me to cover or go over again, um, please give me 24 hours to get back to you. I'll do my best. I'm a one-man show here. If I don't get to you within, say, 24 hours, send me another email. It's not that I'm ignoring you. It's just that uh, I probably forgot. Um, so, God willing, I'll be with you Monday or next Monday. Next Monday. Amen, brother. All right, well, Lord bless George. So good to have you with us, and we'll be together next Monday, little buddy. Okay, we'll take it. Bye bye. All right, brother Eric John Phillips, thank you for tuning in today. My book, Vatican Assassins, one in the house of my friends. Just go to my website, VaticanAssassins.org. Pick up a copy of the ebook there. Also go to 24 7 World Radio. Pick up a copy of these uh, annual broadcasts, that's 2013 to 2022. And also you can sign up for Wellabate. And get all your supplements for 15% discount. A great company. Also, uh, you, you can purchase my tax class where I teach you if you're working in the private sector that you are not subject to the heavy progressive socialist communist income excise privilege tax that everybody's volunteering to pay this in the private sector. So you can take a tax class. Also take my private American national citizenship class. It's three days. And also I have an advanced class that I'm starting to work on. And I should have it done by the beginning of next week. 
which teaches you how to use your new status once you have it established with your filing of your declaration of status in a county court or in a federal district court, which we now also do. So status is everything as it is in salvation. Are you in Christ today? Is your status as in Christ? I trust that you are saved by grace and believe the glorious gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. And having believed that gospel, the Lord saved you and will keep you saved. Status is everything in heaven and on earth here in America. So until Monday or Wednesday, Lord willing, see you then. Maranatha.